Good afternoon. Welcome to Shop Talks, which is a production of the Ink Kitchen, which is free information online, YouTube, uh, etc., and impressions, the show. We got sponsors here, some crazy company, Los Angeles Apparel, Her Solutions, Lane 7, Howard, Stalls, and Alpha Broder. They make it free for all of you, so you should thank them and be grateful. Um, I'm with my friend here, Dove Charney, Los Angeles Apparel. We're gonna talk about garment trends, and he's probably gonna give me a hard time at every question I ask, but I am ready. Let's go. Let's go. All right, so what's going on? Is it the schleppy or schlubby look? What is it's it? It's the schlepper look. Okay, and what is what is that? Like last well, that year, you were saying year. that's happening. I still I think, think it's it. Well, it ha some people had look. The most important thing you got to know about trends in this industry, or all industries, or how human beings operate, is that four percent of the society is innovator. For uh, three percent of the society is innovator. Fourteen percent of the society is early adapter. 34% is early majority, 34% is late majority, and 17% is lagger. And the person that came up with that analysis or came up with those numbers was Malcolm Gladwell, okay? He was a, a, a business uh, philosopher of sorts. It's for, um, anyway, I agree with that. So while thir certain markets are, certain po segments of the population, particularly in the printable garment business, are you know very innovative. I've built my career on kind of working with upstream, with early adapters or early majority. That's how I make make money. Okay, but there's certain companies that do very well selling, selling the bottom half. There's still money, you know, selling people that want to wear something that's perceived as dated by others. That's that's just the way it is. Okay, um, I'm sure you've had clients that want the stuff that you think is already done. So I think even the people that sell the laggards want to know what's going to be lagging soon. In other words, what's going well, on I now, it's going think, down to I them I think there's later. certain segments of the population that have not adapt, adapt, made it, made, ad, uh, adopted oversized garments. Oversized garments, for those of you that are 50 plus, which includes myself, it's kind of the large, larger garment that we would have called urban which was code for black, but it was for like hip hop clothing, oversized hip hop clothing, the very, like 2X, 3X long that um, uh, hip hop uh, performers were wearing, let's say in 1996 or 1997. That's coming back for some or happening right now for others. So that market is new. Actually, you know, it's funny because I have a new customer. It's called Crash Boys. It's sort of like skateboarding, but on bikes. Right. And they have like fake police cars and see how close you can get to them and stuff. He loves your stuff. Like he's, he's all about the six and a half ounce shirts and, oh. and he wants like big. Oversize is coming in, but for some people it's already here. So if you really want to know what's really going on, let's say two, three years forward, the tight the tighter shirts are gonna come back. But for most of the people in this environment, what's coming in is oversized. So it's a rejection of, so I'm, I'm saying we're going, more will go to oversize, but after the oversize era, we're gonna have, we're gonna recede back to tighter fits, but I think they'll be reinterpreted. The tighter fits of tomorrow will be different than the tighter fits of yesterday. There'll be a little bit of an adjustment to the spec. But uh, that's, that's what I think is happening. I still think we're more volume, will, more clients will want oversized. Almost they'll reject the American Apparel 2001 in favor of the Gildan t-shirt, believe it or not, okay? They're gonna want thicker t-shirts. They're gonna want stuff that that's, people will favor. I, who, who here in the audience remembers the upcharge? The upcharge period. Does anybody want to? Who remembers what upcharges are? Painfully. You know what upcharges are? Well, I don't want to ask you how old you are, but upcharges were, upcharges were when everybody just wanted extra large only. 
uh, Sanmar or Alpha Broder or whatever was going on at the time, Cayman textiles or t-shirts, or the major distributors started saying, okay, if you're gonna buy extra large only, if you're gonna buy outside of 1353, small, medium, large, extra large, you're gonna have to pay two dollars or 250 more per dozen or you can't because everybody just wanted at a certain point at some point in the mid 90s maybe it was 94 95 96 you, it like if i was a hip buyer i would just say just give me extra large extra larges were only 23 inches across anyway and i could probably capture most of the market with one size that really screwed haynes and verloom because they they couldn't use their their equipment for small medium so but i, I think we're going into that still but if you look even further past that, there's going to be something new. And I could tell you, define that more precisely if you'd like. Please do. Well, I mean, I'm, I don't mean to be self-promotional. Yes, you do. No, go I, ahead, don't. I honestly don't. I mean, there's only 100 people here. Like, I'm not, you know, but I'll just tell you, I do think I've cracked the code with something new. Well, let's hear about it, please. Okay, so I came up with this new T-shirt that I think is really gonna print, create, print a lot of money for us. And we're gonna be on it early and you know, maybe some people can copy it or not, whatever. But I think it's gonna be, I think 30 singles is gonna make a comeback. Like remember we did American Apparel did 30 singles and Bella appeared with 30 singles then Next Level appeared with 30 singles and then you know, everybody had a 30 single t-shirt. 30 singles became the norm. But there was a time I farted that out of my eye and no one was making 30 single t-shirts. And I remember that time. And now I'm thinking what I'm gonna do. And I think 18 singles, like I was shitting all over 18 single t-shirts when I came up with a 30 singles thing only to readopt it years later. I started with 18 singles, American Apparel, when I was in the, in the 90s. Then I went to 30s by two, 1998. Then I went back to 18 singles in 2016. I'm staying there, but I'm about to relaunch a new t-shirt, which is 30 singles, but it's gonna be a higher neck. It's not gonna be that old wide oh, neck. High crew, like a Stedman or something. Super like high crew, yeah, Stedman, super high crew, high crew. That's right. Those are very important garments. I used to buy and sell those. I appreciate it. It's even, that was like a surf thing, right, originally? People wanted it high collar. Pro Club also was high collar. That was a street kind of thing, kind of South Central Los Angeles, they had the high collar. I remember being in a taxi in Montreal and I was this, this guy, this taxi, so I really like a high collar. I, I thought he's out of his mind, but I know exactly what he means. So the, the, I'm gonna do a 30 single Supima, I'm gonna do like long staple, so it's a little bit silky, doesn't have as much hair as traditional 30 singles that you get from whomever. Right? There's 10 suppliers with a 30 single T. But we're gonna do a 30 single Supima, and I think that's kind of next level because it's something that would cost, let's say, $120 at Nordstrom's or something, a high end, but make it available to the printwear market. And I looked at the um, presentation that Gildan made on the 2001, which they said, hey, this was the original T-shirt that, you know, if you think of the 2001, the most imp what is the most important t-shirt in the last 50 years? It's not the 2001, but what, which t-shirt is it, if we were to guess? Does anybody want to say which one it is? Because there's only one, and we need to be honest about it. Which t-shirt was the most important t-shirt of the last 100 years? Pardon me? Which, is that the, are you saying the Gildan 5000? I wouldn't say it's that. Who else wants to guess? Who's saying that? BPT. Absolutely, man. They won. That is the most important one, Haynes 5180. And that's it. The next most important one, I think, is the 2001. Because everything became the 2001. The, I'm doing this thing called the 1801. The 18s, I'm wearing an 1801 long sleeve right now. I don't know if it's important or not, we'll know in 10 years. You can't say now, you can't say when you're in it what it is, okay? Um, but I think another thing is, is to have f like a finer, like 18 singles, it's open end, Parkdale, come on, USI, 
right? But I'm saying Supima long staple could be really interesting to give people a luxury feeling like an $80 retail, $120 retail t-shirt where they can grab it case price eight fifty. So it's like BVT That's, but farther. Like there was a there were ring spun six, six No, BVT right? let's BVT was never combed. The trick to the BVT is hairy. It was hairy. It was ring spun but not ring spun combed. This is the original BVT. What it morphed into and became was something else. Yeah. You got to go to a vintage store vintage swap meet to sometimes get the right ones from the right years. There's like five variations of it, and I know them by heart. I know them by heart because it's a du my duty to respect the 5180 and understand when it began and where it is now and what are the highs and lows and the different corporate decisions they made. There was a time they dropped blind cover stitch and blind hem and went to two needle cover stitch at Haynes and then Furloom copied it. And I was there at that time, and it was like an inventory crisis. It was interesting because you had some shirts were blind hem and some shirts were two needle. And now a lot of young adults say, well, I like blind hem better. I say, Phew. well, billions are spent to go the other direction. But, you know, there's... Um, Did they do that to be cheaper or because people liked it? Okay, first of all, the two needle hem had less cutoff. It, it could, they, it was perceived to be higher quality that there was two needles versus the blind hem. But young adults today that really think about this stuff like the simplicity and the smoothness of on a t-shirt not having, not having the two needles here, having just that fold over. But it, ha it has to be done well. In South Carolina at Haynes Subcon, I was using Haynes or Haynes, I was parasiting off Haynes' subcontractors. I was selling t-shirts to Carolinas. Operators could sew blind hem faster than two needle. But today they say, well, two needle's slower than, I mean, blind hem is slower than two needle. It's the opposite. It was also like what people were used to. I remember one operator could sew 5,000 blind hems on a t-shirt per day, which is 5,000. Think about it. 5,000 in a day is like what a screen printer could do. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's a lot. Just sewing them. Boo, doo, doo. But I do, think, I do think more luxurious, and I think, Cotton, cotton's gonna make its, cotton is really coming home. You know, who really wants to wear a sublimation tee forever? You know, if you, if you were, if you were gonna be I sent- I don't see any hands. If you were gonna be sent away for a year on an island and you said, look, I got 10 sublimation tees and I got 10 cotton tees, which one, you gotta choose one or the other. Like, who's choosing the sub, the poly t-shirts? I don't care, performance, my ass, cotton. Okay, this is America, our history. I'm an American, I'm, I'm an immigrant to this country. I am an immigrant to this country. I love America. So are all of us. I came to New England. I went to Choate Rosemary Hall I, for, for grade 12 in the United States, known as 12th grade. And, Did um, it kick you out? I almost got kicked out. Yeah, I thought but anyway, right. but I didn't get kicked out. Let's just make that clear. Okay, so... What I can't, what, what, why did I say, America's history is all about cotton, and this is us. We, we're the ones, this is all who we are. This is, and, and Parkdale is doing an awesome job, and so some other spinners coming up, we're, they're still chugging along, automating and making American open-end cotton in the United States, which is amazing. And they're supplying everybody, uh, almost everybody, and they're doing a great job. There's a, there's, there is some competitors as well. Frontier was their competitor, got bought by Gildan, by the way, big event in the last 12 months, that there were two major players, and then whoop, one got pulled out, but new stuff's coming in. That's America, we up, we down, right? It's capitalism. So um, I'm gonna change directions here. Okay, let's go. People care about USA and sustainability, and that they're gonna yeah. care more or less. Especially you with your here? violin. I know, what's going on? Um, yeah, I do a lot of thinking about this. I've, I've made my career made in USA, particularly made in Los Angeles, particularly made in south of the 10 freeway in South Central, also known as South Los Angeles. But deep down, I support free trade. And I was, 
indoctrinated as a young Canadian who believed I was bringing American-made t-shirts into Canada. I supported the FTA agreement, later became NAFTA. I canvassed for it, uh, was under uh, Prime Minister, under Prime Minister Brian Maroney and Ronald Reagan, and you know, I'm never gonna go away from that. I don't believe in borders, and I believe in, I'm a globalist, although some people don't wanna hear that, but blah, blah, blah. So I don't think it's about where it's made. I do like the notion of USA, but not for the purpose of nationalism. I'm not a nationalist. You can make garments well anywhere. Um, but I do believe in higher wages for workers and I believe in automation. And you know, a cell phone anywhere in the world, a good, good smartphones, you know, a good iPhone is a thousand bucks. You know, it's a thousand bucks in Pakistan and it's a thousand bucks in the United States. So I like, I take pride in paying higher wages and I take pride in organizing the manufacturing, you know. I've made a lot of money in this industry, but I've had a great time in it, and uh, I've learned a lot, and I've influenced the culture of our industry. So that's, you know, when you die, you don't, influence is maybe more important than money, but I, I, hope, to, I hope to build, uh, building something pretty big with Los Angeles Peril, it's just, is taking some time. Actually, I'll t take a second, because I think you're known for fashion, but you just hit on a little, that really you're, uh, manufacturing was innovative at the time in terms of like what Marty and you did and what you could pay and produce the quantities that you did and to do it on a dime sometimes. So you, as things change, you can make stuff fast, yeah. faster than it could be brought in. It may happen again with well, the shipping Well, we did prices, it. Well, right? like, never mind. We made $50 million of masks in, out of nowhere. We were the first people to manufacture masks, one of the first in the United States. We we came up with the concept of making masks because we were running out of masks for our workers that were sewing on sewing machines. So we started making them for ourselves. Then I heard this guy in the Czech Republic saying, I read this, I think it was Lex Friedman put up a presentation saying that if you put cloth over your face, it could prevent the spread of the virus. And I said, hey, maybe we should do what this guy's saying. Lo and behold, it, every, the government's saying, no, 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 masks, masks are bad. You could contaminate yourself if you wear one. But we got in early and we got hit hard in a good way. And we built our business. We, Pre-pandemic to now, we've tripled. But things have slowed down. Last two, three, five weeks, I think for everybody, has been a little bit weird. I think many people would agree with that in the building. But this is Mecca. It is ISS Long Beach. This is the beginning. I think they got an early ISS up in Toronto. What's that show called? We attended it. Uh, you were there, Katja. What was it? The Imprint Show in Canada. Who else wa who wants to go to Toronto in the first week of January? It's stupid Me. idea. <laughs> you, you went? I didn't go, but I would go. You would go, yeah, if you did your ink show. Whatever. <laughs> yeah, you, what is this called? Shop talk. All right. Um, but I do, I do think the flexibility... That you can make an efficiency argument for made in USA, and you can make a violin argument for USA. The better option is the efficiency argument. We have the United States, we got what's the GDP per capita in the United States? Almost 70,000 bucks. That's something that we should be proud of in America is how much money we create, how much, how much wealth we generate per person. And they don't have that in Mexico. They don't have that in the UK. They don't have that in Canada. We are the most efficient. That's our culture. It's a culture of efficiency. So this recession we're banging into, this is what we bargained for. This is our culture. It means you boys have to, or you people, not boys, you women and men have to play harder, hardball, and make America, make the world stronger because you, there's too much excess and you guys got to bang down and do it for the Rome which we're Rome now, and, and just make it happen. So this is gonna be an interesting time. And getting on the right trend early, that's part of Made in USA. Who wants to screen print overseas? Wasted time. Because when you're screen printing, little I know about it, you wanna make it just right. And to get the inks right, the positioning right, whether you use this manufacturer of ink or that manufacturer of ink, how many people screwed up poly cotton teas using cotton ink or vice versa? You know, all those little details, you know you, you perfect the science. And to be able to make garments in America, even though screen printing is also made in USA, even if the shirt's made in Paris. So I, I believe in world manufacturing. My gimmick, my game is made in USA. And that's why I think 
I was thinking I built a business that's quite large, not a public company, so I'd have to share my sales here. But I will tell you, we built an awesome business and we built it quickly. Now, if it wasn't a made in USA, operate, forget made in USA, if I wasn't manufacturing it in my own manufacturing facility where I could watch over it and sleep in the factory if I so choose, I wouldn't be able to scale to tens and tens and tens and tens of millions of dollars right away if I was waiting for it on a boat somewhere. So there's scalability in Made in USA and I like it. I intend, you know, I'm, I'm, I got another 20, 30 years, 40 years to work, who knows, as long as my health will take me. And I intend to build a large scale business that exceeds American Apparel at some point. But um, it wouldn't happen without me manufacturing the stuff myself because my edge is innovation. My edge is I got it ahead of the other people. And I've pegged myself, my audience is that. And you know, so I don't even, there's money selling laggers, I'm just not interested in it. All right, it's good to have goals. <laughs> yeah, it is. I see Ilsa Mitchek here, president of the California Fashion Association. She's wearing a neon orange t-shirt. It's polyester. I actually want to tell you about a story about Ilsa. That's funny, because I had an argument with her that I think I won. She's leaving. No, it's about Made in USA. I said, you know, Ilsa, you can manufacture in the USA. You can do it in Los Angeles. She's an advocate for Made in Los Angeles, Made in California. She's the president of the California Fashion Association. She's saying the government's made it so difficult so many times that so much stuff is left. And I said, you could still do it. You know, it's a challenge but it still can be done. And I remember she saying, well, you can make t-shirts, but you can't make jackets and ties. And I said, I think you can. And we did, we did, it. we did. We, I think I, over, I overcame her criticisms of it. It's possible, but it's a lot harder. <laughs> but it's also the opportunity for me. Like I'm saying, I don't think I could have rebuilt my business as rapidly without having a hands-on uh, ability to manipulate it quickly. Go ahead. All right, let's take some questions. What do you think about that Okay, action? let's go. All right, who's got a question? First, we gotta have a mic. Who's got a question? <clears throat> They're afraid they'll get abused. <laughs> I will attack you. <laughs> oh. Oh, yes. oh, oh well, somebody's gonna fight back here. California Fashion Association, CFA. So, Dove, what's your biggest problem? Well, I do think the regulatory environment is tough. Yeah, sure, what she's fighting for, the amount of lawsuits, the amount of weird stuff that, the, the, you know, there's so many triggers to operate in California, in Los Angeles, even between the county and the city. Yeah, it's tough, sure, of course. But I think as in a society, that argument is playing out. You know, there's the Florida version of life and there's the California version of life. And I hope America and I hope Los Angeles and I hope California finds its way. But it can be extreme. It can be extreme and there is a risk to over-regulating. The beauty of Los Angeles is it's a, there, we manufacture things. We have a young population. We have a motivated workforce, a motivated entrepreneurial class. And it's being hampered somewhat by, by um, social progressives, you know? And I, I'm not saying they don't have a good mission in place, but there is a struggle that has to be worked out. And we're, we're fighting that struggle, but that's probably one of the biggest risks, a major risk factor. You know, it's, 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 it's a fine here, a lawsuit there, an insurance premium here, an insurance premium there, and all of a sudden you're out of money, you know? Go to a place with no regulation. Ugly, too, right? Where is that? Like, I don't know, plenty of countries and stuff that don't regulate anything. It's bad. Well, there's a middle ground to everything, yeah, right? Exactly. Life's all about balance, and yeah. success is all about balance. And that's the American experience. You know, we're, we've been struggling for a long time. We started off with a war, you know? <laughs> started off in 1776. All right, we, who else has a question? Brave souls out there, come on. Some of you have been drinking. You're not gonna ask a question? <laughs> no questions, really. 
So this Made in USA, I mean, there's a lot of different angles to it, and it's, it's uh, made the press recently. Can you maybe talk about what it means to be Made in USA? Because everybody's kind of tiptoeing around the edge at times as far as uh. what's sourced. Maybe some of the specifics. And, I mean, I, I know what First I... First of all, if it's mean? made in the United States, it's probably the workers... There's probably a larger portion of the selling price is labor. It means more money is going to the workers. It means probably there's more care in manufacturing the product. M Made in USA is it, it's really about having oversight over the production, not just from a social progressive point of view, but also like looking at the goods, touching the goods, trying the goods on, modifying the manufacturing process. I think it can mean quality. It can. I personally, like, I wear my t-shirts by choice. I, when I wake up in the mornings, I wish I had. There's no other manufacturer here I would wear just because I don't like their fits. If there was something, wow, their fit's great, I wish I could wear that. I can't think of a single t-shirt I wear other than my own. So it's, and, and you, you're able to craft things, pivot. Like, this morning I was still designing for the show. Swear to God, I had this guy, Tyler. Right over there, like I love to beat up on him. It's just so much fun. It's bullying. It's really just awful what I do to him. But I made him like make these new signs. I was picking garments out of the, this garbage pile. I said, bring this to the show, this one. And then lo and behold, one of my employees, Katya, said, how much is a Supima tea going to be? Got a text, let's say uh, 850. You know, like um, it was interesting that you have that. You could pivot. You could do things. You could, you could pull back. You could go forward. And... You know, it's, it's like craftsmanship. But I, I, it does frighten me when people say made in America. It's not about protecting America. It's about making things. T-shirts are basically invented in the United States to, as we know them. You know, it's part of our culture to make T-shirts. We love T-shirts. It's funny, though, when people talk about the labor. I don't know why they're... It's, once in a while you see bullshit where they're like made and I don't know it's people cutting the fabric you know I don't know it's one cutter to like about 50 people sewing or more what's the ratio these days it's not the important labor part and then people I seem to forget yeah I mean if you cut your fabric here that's a small part of the operation versus the sewing in terms of yeah, labor cutting right I think my cut uh, my see, cutting people say they do stuff in the US and it's only the cutting and then that's not a lot of labor but that works too maybe you cut it here gives you some flexibility uh, my thing no, is flexibility but I mean when people are talking about like oh we're doing all this for labor or, or whatever that's that's a small piece of it I personally don't like the made in USA thing where it's invokes woke culture or it invokes nationalism. Nationalism being on the right, woke being on the left. I, I just, it, it's stinky. Oh, made in America because we're first. Or this idea like, made in America because we're the only ones helping workers. There, there are factories all over the world that care about their workers, presumably not just American factories, right? So you have to be careful with made in America, but what I do think is for sure one could say, I'm an amazing screen printer. I don't sub my work. I have my own machines. I work on the shop floor. I know my quality. I'm Joe screen printer, right? That's made in US. Uh, I'm a, like, I, I know my stuff. I'm not just like sending it off to sub off and bye bye You know what I'm saying? It's about making it oneself. That's our angle. Telling at, your story, right? Like what? to tell your story is important, right? But which Tell them your story. Like, if you're making it yourself, tell that story, right? That's marketing it. But your story is also told without talking. It's when they get the T-shirts and they love them. When they get the print. When they love the quality. And it's on autopilot. That's Too many people are telling stories. Product. I'm talking about true stories. I know, but the product's important. Made in USA can lead, in the case of myself, it could lead to crap product and great product. It has the potential to be both, but it has the potential to be super great because the company making it is making it themselves, presumably, right? That they're close to the manufacturing. So much of what we make in America, like it's designed in California, but made somewhere else. That whole thing that Apple, I'd like to see Apple say, we made it. 
<laughs> you know, say not that it, we we designed it and sent it to Foxconn, and then twenty five workers were like throwing themselves out of a building. Like, how many people committed suicide at Foxconn? I mean, it's a little out of control. Like, I understand if there was one or two, but like twenty five people killed themselves. Like, what are they doing in there? <laughs> you know, if it's that bad. Or remember Rainier Plaza? I was telling. Is it Rainier Plaza that with the building that fell down in Pakistan with eleven hundred people? I was talking to a couple of young adults. At Bangladesh, work I think. It was. Yeah. I was talking to a couple of young people that work for you. They don't even know what that story is. It's like the largest industrial accident in world history. 1,100 people died in a sewing building in Bangladesh. That's kind of weird. Like, who the hell was managing that? Well, they had to sew. They had to keep sewing because if they were late, they were going to get a cancellation. So, of course, they were going to make the people work to death. You know, and the quality coming out of Bangladesh is always weird. It's not because the people in Bangladesh aren't trying hard to produce amazing product is that they're just trying to follow the leader, follow the leader. They're following the, spe- the tech pack. Tech pack, tech pack, tech pack. The tech pack sucks. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's, it's like it's, but if, if that's, that's the whole thing. It's we've bifurcated innovation from manufacturing because of the whole global inequalities. But through globalization, information, automation, you're gonna have onshoring where peop- it, it's no longer viable to make stuff too far away from the, the point of sale. So that's where it's going. It's more for technological reasons that made in USA could be important than, and, and innovation reasons than thematic reasons. Go ahead. Amen. Next question. Uh, I know you said oversize is coming in, and then soon it's going to be the tight. Um, so what other? Not soon, in okay. the medium range, couple okay. years. Like okay. there's this young kid. I don't remember what his name was, but he was he I'm was. Finish the question. I want to. Okay. okay. You weren't quite done. All right. What other predictions are in the midst of? So what else is happening besides uh, uh, thinner fabrics again, 30 singles or whatever? Well, the, the, uh, a big, in the same vein, I was going to say this young adult that was working temporarily as an intern, I forgot his name, but he was still wearing over, oversized pants, but he started wearing tight, um, what used to be known as a wife beater, some people call a man beater. I think that's coming in like a tubular Frutaloom or Hanes piece, maybe a little bit higher end than that, okay, because those are pretty flimsy, but tubular um, kind of uh, uh, two-by-one tank tops, which we're about to launch as well. Like ribbed, I mean? Ribbed, and printing on that. Don't forget, this industry started by, you were, A, it was printing packaged underwear, B, Haynes said, we need to make t-shirts for the printer, and which customer said they just have to have printable t-shirts. It was Ocean Pacific in Orange County, and Haynes decided in 1975 they're gonna cater to that, to printable t-shirts. But it started with underwear. I think the underwear, the Haynes underwear, red label, wife beater as it's called, is gonna come in. And there could be a hybrid of like oversized pants but tight tops which you've seen coming in the women's market could come to the men's market as a second phase. Um, I also think Baby Rib, which was big at American Apparel uh, from 1996 to 2012, it's coming back. I noticed Bella is featuring Baby Rib posters on the entry. I think, um, uh, and I, you know, we were the first to do it, and Bella adopted it after, but still, they've been doing it a long time. I think all that kind of look is coming back. Tighter tees, but on the women's side, uh, this summer going to be... We're seeing activity, like we, get, uh, we keep getting stocked out on, on, on what's known as baby rib. 30 single rib is going to be hot. We hate printing it, but okay. No, no problem. Uh, <laughs> We do. We hate printing it, but... Oh, printing on rib is an art. It's an art to print it nice to where it stretches out. It's an opportunity, I meant. It's an art opportunity. That's what Made in USA is. It's an art opportunity. All right. Any other questions? All right. How about a hand for Doug Oh, he had a question. Oh, question. Here we go. All right. Saved by the bell. 
So as decorators, how can we position our companies and our shops uh, to be prepared for an, kind of an upcoming economic downturn and a recession? What things should we be doing kind of as we go into the first quarter to be ready and be resilient? You mean to save money? It's tough, man. Start hunkering down, cut your expenses, get rid of your bottom, lay off your bottom employees, but be careful when you lay off employees, that's, you gotta manage those separations carefully because it could lead to litigation. And it often does, you know, you gotta do it gracefully and you gotta do it carefully and surgically that you don't hurt yourself. I know, oh, just lay off the, lay off these 20 people. Like four months later, I don't know, I've been hit with all these lawsuits. Like it's 10 times worse. And you know, um, that just managing your staff, maybe putting some people four days a week instead of five if they're on hourly, just traipsing through and keeping your inventories low, watching your receivables, making sure everybody pays their bills. Being tighter with credit is important because people may not pay, you know, and, and hoard cash. Don't, don't expand right now. Um, you know, maybe forego taking risks that you don't need to take. And it's a scary time. It's going to be hard. But this is, this, is what, this is what being an American capitalist is all about. This is what, what the Cold War was all about. was fighting for this freedom for you to lose money during a recession. They were fighting for it. Just to give you this great opportunity to shit your pants during a recession. <laughs> okay. um, so this is what it is. You just got um, to hunker down and figure it out. Sharpen your pencil. Look at your financial statements. Make sure your financial statements are authentic. The worst thing you do is trick yourself into thinking you're making money if you're not. And, you know, try to get, try to work some older accountants that have been around the block because they've been through a few recessions, so they know, and try and get some free advice over lunch. <laughs> okay. okay. Any other that. questions? <laughs> so I want to know what your favorite memory is when you started American Apparel. My favorite memory? Yep. Oh, I have so many, but I'll, I'll give you two. One, I love selling t-shirts in front of the Montreal Forum. I had, you know, when I was, I was buying Hanes underwear t-shirts and bringing them to Montreal, and it was, it was, it was $10, this past $7 US t-shirt. <laughs> yeah, that was it. <laughs> um, that was one, and the second best memory, oh. Flying to California, okay. I looked up, I got all the yellow pages for Orange County, uh, Los Angeles, and, San, and, and Santa Barbara, and I sent everybody a little package with my girlfriend, Julie, of a baby rib tea, 4305, and we sent them out in yellow envelopes, and then we flew to California two weeks later, and we asked each person if we could meet with them to talk about baby rib teas in 1996. And, or, Flew to 1995 or 96. I remember flying to California, looking out the window and the landing. That was a memory. Because that garment, I think it was style 4300. We still have 4305 right now. Um, that was a great memory. Baby tees. And just, a, a, just growing up in California, making it happen. But prior to that, running around South Carolina doing it. It's... It's been a wonderful experience, and I'm, I'm, I'm very thankful to have had it up until now. I think we yeah. end on that one. <laughs> All right. How about a hand for Dove Charney? Thank you. I want to thank the sponsors, Los Angeles Apparel in particular, Hirsch, Lane 7, Alpha, Stalls, Howard. Check out. Oh. So we're printing posters over uh, as you head into the other thing, and we're giving the money to a charity the, really awesome. The guy that runs it goes out to these homeless encampments, gives people like the basics so that they can uh, live a little better, and he picks up trash with them. They've picked up a million pounds of trash, and they paint over graffiti, and he kind of interacts with them and then brings them along to uh, maybe get their life together a little bit more, but treats them well in the meantime, and these posters are being sold for that cause, so if you want to, stop by and buy one over in the other uh, hall, all right? All right. Thank you. All right.